Emery, can I borrow your stool? Thank you. Many of you don't know, this is Emery's precious stool, and I would never borrow it without asking first. So I wanted, I wanted to share with you this morning, and it's different than what I shared at 8, because as I was preaching at 8 o'clock, thoughts started coming to mind, and what we were talking about this morning seemed like a bigger conversation. And I wanted to have more of a conversation. So some of this feels a little, uh, this is a little uh, extemporaneous. And so you'll have to forgive me, but the spirit moves. Um, I find myself wrestling with the same question all the time. I was talking to a colleague about it this week, a good friend of mine. And he said, it sounds like you're having a crisis of faith. I said, I'm not having a crisis of faith. I believe in God and Jesus full, full in. Like, I, I am all in. Uh, the question I ask myself on a regular basis as a priest is why do we need church? Why do we need to come to church on Sunday mornings? And it's a question I ask not necessarily in the kind of the spiritual sense, but in the sense that uh, I've been tasked uh, to be your priest and shepherd and to grow a church. And so I keep coming back to myself almost as, as, as the chief uh, salesman, right? Like, why, why does the world need this product that, that we're selling? Why does the world need Jesus? And not just why does the world need Jesus, but why does the world need, why does Londonderry need a place that on Sunday mornings or Saturday evenings opens up its doors and invites people in to worship? Because truth be told, we can pray at home. We can worship at home. I know an answer we often hear is community. I, I like the community we get at St. Peter's. But when I'm honest with myself, I know we get community from other places too. And so I often find myself wrestling with God. Why, God, why do you need us in 2017? Why is it important for us to get out of bed? Uh, at 9.30 on a weekend. And, uh, and God, God bless you, moms and dads, bringing your kids to church. On, it's not easy. You know, I'm sure each week you all have the same thought. What do, do I need to do this this Sunday? And so that brings us to today's readings and some of the events of this week. I, like many of you, are just completely at my wit's end when it comes to the national conversation. Our country has been in a state of debate and discord, I mean, really for decades now, really, but it's it reached a fever pitch over the last summer and then into November. And I thought, like many of you, no matter who won the election in November, at least we would be done with, with the election season, right? But it, it's almost like, uh, I, 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 I've never been through it myself, but it almost feels like if, you've been, if, you're, uh, if you're a mother and you've been given a due date and it's your, your 39th week, and now we're in week 41, right? And we're like, I thought this was going to be over by now, but it's not. I was meeting with a bunch of priests this week. Uh, we, had a, we meet once a month as the clergy of the Diocese of New Hampshire. And we were talking about how exhausted we were about the national conversation and how we all acknowledged an anxiety that just permeates every part of our culture. That is, the anxiety itself is unhealthy, but the sustained exposure to the anxiety. They're going to study the long-term effects of this period in our history forever. What is it doing to us as a culture? I, this is not new, but I had an experience this week where my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law is one of the nicest guys you'd ever meet. He's a real true, he's a kind of true blood independent to the point that until very recently, he's just never voted, which we, he and I have had our, our conflict about that in itself. Uh, but he 
posted on, on, on Facebook this, which, you know, Facebook, the source of all strife, right? Um, he posted on Facebook earlier this week uh, a status that was uncharacteristic of him. It was unkind, which is certainly uncharacteristic of him, but it was also, it was unkind to the president, which for him to just take a stand was surprising. I checked in uh, on his conversation under his Facebook status, as you know, they, they accumulate throughout the day. And what I read was some of the most vitriolic, hateful, disgusting language. And I'm used to that in the comment sections of some of the more fringy websites. I don't read the comments. Don't read the comments. Do yourself a mental health favor. If you're reading the news online, stop at the end of the article. I'll really, just stop at the headline. But if you go further, stop at the end of the article. But I read the comments and I was disgusted and appalled. And so was he, because 24 hours later, he actually deleted his comment. Uh, there were, when I last saw it, really, which is shortly before he deleted it, there were 220 comments. This, yeah, right? He's not a Kardashian, right? He doesn't have thousands of followers but for, for his comment. But that's where we are right now. We're in this, this place where we're just confused and angry. And our leaders, all of them, they failed us. They failed us as an example on how to live. Not the, we can debate governance and the role of government in society. That's a different conversation that I know people in New Hampshire would love to have, because that seems like what you do here. But it's the way that our leaders behave and act now. And I don't, I don't just mean the president and his tweets. I just mean the way that we, we refer to ourselves and we laugh and we're snide, and not we, the, the, the sarcasm. And so what does this have to do with church? This morning's reading, we hear about Stephen. Stephen's the first deacon. He's not a priest, but he's a servant of the people of the way. So before we called ourselves Christians, uh, we, weren't, we didn't get that title yet. Uh, they, we called ourselves people of the way because as we hear in the gospel this morning, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, I am the life. We are people of the way. And it's not an easy way. But Stephen is uh, a deacon of the way, and he is martyred. He's one of our church's first martyrs. He's martyred for uh, his belief in Jesus. And at the end of it, I'm struck by his response, particularly in light of today's world, that he doesn't go down blaming uh, those who killed him. He doesn't go down blaming Jesus for sending him out into this God-forsaken atmosphere where the people of the way are being murdered. He says, and he emulates Jesus, he says, forgive them. Father, forgive them. My goodness. What would it look like if just we had a hint of that level of grace from our leaders? So why do we need church? it becomes more and more apparent to me by the week that the world needs grace-filled Christians. Because once upon a time, not too long ago, we were able to rely on our leaders and uh, public figures as examples on how to live. Statesmen like polite conduct. Part of the anxiety of this current state of affairs is the loss of the gentleman or the, the, the gentlewoman, uh, the loss of having people our children can look up to, which puts a lot of the responsibility on us. And that's why I think it matters that we come to church on Sunday. Because we're sure not going to get anything like this anywhere else. Particularly in 2017 in America, we're not going to hear stories of Stephen, the one who dies for their beliefs and goes down not swinging, but asking for forgiveness. We're not going to get leaders like Jesus who say, this path, this calling that you have, it's going to be hard, hard as nails. They're going to kill you for it. But this is the way. I've come to show you the way. The world needs 
every one of us in this room to take this mantle with us into the world, on, into Londonderry, into Derry, into Wyndham, uh, tomorrow, changed. And not reactionary, not living with the anxiety of the world, but to be able to say, you know what, I, you may believe that or feel that way. In this moment, I'm going to choose, I'm just going to love you. I'm not going to bother, I'm not going to get into debate. I'm going to choose love. And then maybe if the, the country sees Christians such as us, people of the way, right? Maybe they think, oh, I need some of that too. Because I guarantee you, just as tired as we all are of the anxiety, I think we're all pretty thirsty for something like this too. And we're not going to get it anywhere else. So if Londonderry has, I don't know, whatever of us, 50 of us that go out into the world on, uh, on Monday, changed, not living in anxiety and fear, but in love and choosing to embrace that, what would that look like? And then what would it look like if we started to say, hey, there's something about the way I'm living my life. Come, I, I want you to check this thing out. I'm not, I'm not, don't worry, I'm not going to evangelize to you. I'm not going to make you, I'm not going to baptize you until you're ready. And if you are, let me know. But I'm not gonna, we're just going to show that we're, we have something special here. And then what if the Episcopal Church in New Hampshire started to look like a bunch of people not choosing anxiety or fear or blame, but choosing love and grace? And then what if, what if we somehow, in some miracle, pie in the sky, what if we reclaimed what it meant to be a Christian in 2017? Because if you open up uh, the New York Times, the word Christian doesn't mean this right now. It means fear and blame and exclusion the exact antithesis of what we're talking about this morning. <clears throat> I'm preaching to myself this morning because I'm the one wrestling with why we need church. We need church because this matters more in May of 2017 in London, area, New Hampshire than ever has. And we need it. We need to know that we can be changed by it. And we also need to know that we living as disciples of the way of Jesus Christ can bring that peace and love and grace into the world and slowly push back against whatever it is that's out there now. So I pledge this morning that instead of doing what I do and engage in the toxicity and in the backbiting and the blaming, this week, I along hopefully with you, I'm going to choose this. I'm going to choose the way of Stephen. I'm going to choose grace and I'm going to choose love. I'm going to say, I'm going to choose not to buy into the anxiety this week. I'm going to choose not to buy into the blame. I'm going to choose to buy into grace and forgiveness and love. And then maybe a year from now, things will look different and we, we will made it through the rain, as Carly Simon once said. Right, Carly Simon? Made it through the rain? Phew. Right. If you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna reach for a reference, you better be right, right? Um, anyway, that's why we need church. Uh, that's why I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, that's why I'm glad we get to do this each week together, and uh, that's why I'm glad to know that we are people of the way, not people of whatever the heck it is out there. Amen. Thanks for listening. If you like the sermon. Click subscribe and give us a thumbs up below. Your feedback helps us share what God is up to here in Londonderry with the rest of the internet. See you next week.